Hi, and welcome back to Coco Sleep, a brand new podcast of original children's bedtime stories designed to make bedtime a dream. In the last episode, we got to know Coco the koala, our mascot for the show, and learn about his favourite things to do that help him settle down for a good night of deep sleep and fun dreams. We'll learn lots more about him and his friends and family in coming episodes, so please ask your adult to subscribe to the Coco Sleep Podcast to make sure you don't miss any episodes. Tonight, we're leaving Sleepy Forest and travelling to a magical school which lies beneath the streets of a busy, bustling city. It's the first story in a brilliant series called The Jupiter Twins. We'll join Lily and Jake Jupiter on their first day of school and share the wonders which await them inside the enchanted building. Before we meet the twins, though, relax into your bed. To help you relax, try stretching out your legs and feet and pointing your toes for a few seconds. And now let them go all floppy. Wiggle your fingers and then rest your hands by your side. Take some nice deep breaths. In and out. In and out. And now... Snuggle down a little bit more. Great. Now you're ready. It's time for me to begin tonight's story, The Jupiter Twins, The Magic Begins, by Gillian Rogerson. It was on a sunny September morning, with just the whisper of autumn in the air that young twins Lily and Jake Jupiter climbed the stone steps of the grand entrance to Leeds Town Hall with a glimmer of excitement in their eyes. Cars and buses drove along the road behind them. Pedestrians made their way to shops, cafes and workplaces. People reclined on benches enjoying the freshness of the morning air. It looked like a normal day. But it wasn't. Not for Lily and Jake. They had just turned 13. And as they had been born into a family with magical abilities, they'd been invited to attend the Leora Academy, a renowned school of magic. And this was their very first day. When they reached the top step, Lily said to Jake, Are you ready? Jake gave her a big smile. I've been ready for months. They looked at the wristwatches which had been sent to them from the academy the previous week, along with precise instructions on how to use them. The twins carefully moved the hands on the watch faces to 13 o'clock. Have we done it right? Jake asked his sister. We'll soon see came her reply. They waited for the magic to begin. A few seconds later, chimes sounded out from the town hall, counting the hours. Even though it was nine o'clock, the tones continued until they reached twelve. There was a moment's pause, and then a thirteenth chime rang out, sounding clearer and sharper than the previous ones. A change came over the city. Pedestrians became as still as statues. Cars and buses stopped moving. Birds fell quiet. The breeze dropped. A tranquil silence descended on the city as it froze in time. All of a sudden... The gravelly sound of moving stone cut through the quiet air. One of the four Portland stone lions at the side of the town hall's entrance slowly came to life. He rose to his feet and arched his back, making a sound like pebbles rolling down a hill. The lion leapt from his stone plinth and landed in front of the twins. A slow smile settled on his sculptured face. 
The lion spoke in a deep voice. Lily and Jake Jupiter, it's good to finally meet you. Let me introduce myself. I'm Elias, one of the guardians of the academy. Lily said shyly, we know who you are. We've read all about you. Elias's smile grew. That's good to know. I see you've brought your parents with you. Oh no, Lily replied. We haven't. We're thirteen now and we don't need walking to school. Elias chuckled. They are hiding behind that post box along the road. Who can blame them for wanting to be with you on this special day? Are you ready to enter the building? Lily and Jake nodded in unison. Elias waved his paw over the steps to his right. Slowly and soundlessly, a narrow section of stairs opened upwards on an invisible hinge to reveal a set of descending marble steps within. The lion got to his feet gave them a regal bow and said, Off you go. Have the most magical of days. Lily? Jake? I assume you know all about first day privileges. Lily said they did, but didn't know what theirs would be. Elias nodded. It's different for every pupil. I can now tell you what your first one is. When you get to the bottom of the marble steps, you'll come across a spiral staircase which has 700 stairs. It's quite a hike down. But today, you're allowed to slide down the banister. It's a lot of fun. I've done it more than once. He winked at them. Off you go. The twins thanked Elias and then took their first steps into the Leora Academy. Down the pale pink marble stairs they went. Sparkling crystals and gems encrusted within the rock lit their way. When they came to the spiral staircase, Lily noticed the concerned look on her brother's face and offered to go first. She climbed onto the polished banister and pushed herself away. Her cries of delight filled the air, causing Jake to relax. A minute later, he followed her on the winding journey. Lily was waiting for him at the bottom, her eyes shining with joy. She whispered, Jake, we're here. We're finally here. Can you believe it? I can't. He looked ahead at the long hall which led to their first port of call, the office of Dr. Eleanor Howard, the head teacher of the academy. He drew Lily's attention to a letter pinned on a cork notice board. The letter had their names on it. Lily opened the letter. Jake, it's another first day privilege. We can cast an enchantment on the floor and travel to Dr. Howard's office however we want. We have to decide which enchantment to use. The twins read through their options. They could turn the floor into ice and skate along it, or create a long trampoline and bounce from one end to the other. They could use a zip line as their choice of travel. There was also the chance to create an obstacle course comprising of bridges, tunnels, twisty slides and monkey bars. Not only that, they had the option to use scooters powered by nuggets of magical shadow stone. Jake sighed. I can't decide. They all sound great. I wish we could have all of them. 
The letter rose from Lily's hand and folded itself into a paper aeroplane. It flew along the hall, emitting a plume of silver smoke behind it, which gently floated to the wooden surface of the floor, like glitter in a snow globe. The twins watched in astonishment as the floor rippled and changed into many different textures. We can have all of them, Lily said in an awed whisper. Have we just cast our first enchantment? Jake shrugged, not knowing the answer. The twins grinned at each other before proceeding along the charmed pathway. They skated smoothly over the sparkling surface of the frozen wood, a few flakes of soft snow fluttering onto their heads. Onto the bouncy trampoline next, jumping so high that their outstretched hands touched the ceiling. The zip lining followed, and then it was onto the obstacle course. After that came their chance to ride the scooters. Powered by Shadowstone, the scooters lifted off the ground and bore the twins onwards, making them feel as if they were flying. They landed smoothly outside Dr. Howard's office and stepped off the scooters. A second later, the enchanted floor returned to its normal appearance. That was amazing! Lily said with a big grin on her face. She looked at the door in front of her. The smile on her face faltered. Sensing his sister's nerves, Jake said he'd go into the office first. He raised his fist to knock. He never made contact with the door because it swiftly swung open. Come in, come in, a cheery voice called out. The door opened wider and the twins were met by the spectacular sight of a golden sandy beach, the blue sea sparkling in the distance. An azure sky dotted with swooping seagulls completed the scene. The sound of the rolling waves mixed with the faint noise of someone playing a guitar. Jake went through the open door and stepped onto the soft sand. A warm breeze tickled his face. Lily followed him and whispered, We're on a beach. I know. With the sea and sand and palm trees and the sea and sand. I know, Jake repeated. Do you like it? A voice asked from a hammock swaying between two palm trees. It was the same cheery voice which had bidden them to enter. The hammock swung forward and a woman gracefully climbed out and walked towards the twins. With her long, navy hair and sapphire eyes, it was the unmistakable face of Dr. Eleanor Howard. She was wearing a flowing green dress, covered in bright yellow sunflowers and red flip-flops adorned her feet. A pineapple-shaped glass was in her hand. Dr. Howard stopped in front of the twins and smiled at them. Jake, Lily, let me get you a drink. This pineapple juice is exquisite. She clicked her fingers and the same pineapple-shaped glasses appeared in front of the twins. They plucked them as though taking apples from a tree. Waving her hand around the beach, Dr. Howard explained it was her latest shape-shifting spell. To change one's own shape is easy enough, as you will soon learn. But to change a room takes much more practice. Alas, I'm still experiencing some teething issues with this spell, 
such as the T-Rex playing the guitar over there. I've no idea where he came from, and he's terrible on that instrument. But I'm not going to be the one who tells him. Have you seen the size of him? The twins' heads turned in the direction of the enormous dinosaur. Dr. Howard continued talking. Jake, Lily, I'm sure you're eager to explore the academy. You'll want to meet your fellow pupils and teachers and discover what lessons you'll be learning in your first year. And you're no doubt eager to see your dormitories. Jake and Lily sipped on their drinks and nodded eagerly. Before you do any of that, you'll need your book of magic. It contains everything you need to know about the school and much more. With another click of her fingers, two black velvet-bound books appeared in front of the twins. Jake was the first to take his book and open it. His brow creased in confusion when he saw the blank pages. Dr. Howard said, You have to explore the academy and find three hidden gems. Each gem should be placed on the spine of the book. Once they're in place, the book would reveal its secrets. If you know the history of Leora Academy well, you will succeed. You must go now. We will talk later. The pineapple-shaped glasses vanished from the twins' hands, and Dr. Howard returned to the hammock, calling out a goodbye over her shoulder. Feeling somewhat confused, Lily and Jake returned to the hallway with their blank books held against their chests. They walked on down the hall, leaving a small trail of sand behind them. It wasn't long before they came upon an open door. They went inside and discovered a large map printed on the floor. Small silver figures floated down from the ceiling and hovered in front of them. The twins looked closely at the figures before turning to each other in bewilderment. Lily said, You don't think these figures are the early settlers, do you? The ones who founded the school? Jake said he did think that, and going by the map of Great Britain in front of them, they should put the figures in the right places and in the right order. Lily admitted she couldn't remember the order, but Jake said he could. From memory, he began to recite the story of how mythical creatures from around the world set out on a quest thousands of years ago to find the perfect location for a new school of magic. As he named each magical creature, Lily put the appropriate figurine in the right area on the map. The quest had begun in Scotland and on the outer islands there. The beings known as Selkies declared it the perfect place for the new school, not only because of the coolness of the water, which was perfect for them, but because of the iridescent purples, pinks and blue tints of the northern lights, which were so magnificent to watch. The Pixies did not care for the colder atmosphere, so a journey was made to the southern part of England, whereupon the Pixies fell in love with the sandy beaches and hidden caves. But the Centaurs claimed somewhere open and wild would be better, somewhere they could run freely. Hence the quest took the group to Wales. The search did not end there because the Yetis said they preferred forest environments and so everyone headed to an area which is now known as Sherwood Forest. However, the Mer people 
declared being near a river soothed the creature's soul, and took the group to a long, meandering river, which would be called the Thames. The mythical creatures would have discussed the matter for years if it wasn't for the sudden appearance of a wise owl. After saying she knew the perfect place for the school, the owl led them to the centre of England and to Yorkshire. The group were guided towards a long, winding river, where the owl explained future settlers would build a city there, full of friendly humans with hearts of gold, and also the uncanny ability to speak their minds when needed. And so the new school was constructed beneath the ground not far from the river. Enchanted portals were added which led to lagoons, caves, forests, mountains, lakes and many more landscapes so that everyone's needs were met. Jake concluded his tale and Lily placed the last figure in the middle of Leeds. It was a replica of the wise owl. As soon as the bird was in place, two sapphires appeared on the map. They rose and moved towards the blank books. They fixed themselves into place on the spine. Lily and Jake left the room and once more walked down the hallway. They soon happened upon another door. They entered a room full of floating bubbles. It took them barely any time to realise the room represented a fable called The Night of a Thousand Dreams. The fable said sleep fairies flew around towns and cities in the twilight hours, watching for dreams which would float from houses. The fairies collected them in bottles until they each had a thousand dreams. Then they would take the bottles to a special cave and place them on shelves. If the fairies became aware of someone having trouble sleeping, a fairy would take a bottle of the dreams and let the bubbles float into the home of the restless sleeper. Without fail, the dreams would lead the person to slumber and a restful night's sleep. Jake wondered what the fable had to do with the gems they were searching for. Lily pointed to two empty bottles standing on the floor. Then she raised her hand towards the nearest bobbing bubble. I think these bubbles are our dreams. I remember having that one over there. It's about a tree house in the clouds. And you told me about that dream of yours when you flew on the back of an emerald dragon. Can you see it just behind you? I think we have to collect our dreams and put them in these bottles. But how will we reach them? Jake asked. Some of the bubbles are near the ceiling. No sooner had he said those words than a pair of silver wings materialised on the back of each twin. Within seconds, they were flying around the room chasing dreams. As soon as they reached out for a bubble, it would pop and a sprinkle of glitter floated towards the bottles on the floor and trickled inside. When the last of the dreams were inside the bottles, Lily and Jake returned to the floor and their wings vanished. Jake gazed at the bottles. 
I wonder if any of those dreams will come true. They might. We are in a school of magic, after all. The bottles turned into rubies and attached themselves to the spines of the velvet-covered books. The twins left the room. Instead of the hallway outside, They were faced with a wide expanse of night sky. Stars twinkled and sparkled like gems. What do we do now? Lily asked. What's the sky got to do with the history of this school? Don't you remember? Lily shook her head. Jake pointed towards the star-filled sky and said, There are many constellations which are visible to humans, Pegasus and Pisces, Aquarius and Aquila, Lepus the hare and Cygnus the swan. But there is only one constellation which can be seen by those with magical abilities. I've never seen her before, but now that we're inside this school, we might be able to see her. Let's try. The twins scanned the sky until they found what they were looking for. There she is! Lily pointed to the left. The wise owl who led the first founders here, Leora. As though hearing her name, the star-shaped owl flapped her wings and flew from the sky. She landed in front of the twins, matching them in height. Her wings opened out and two stars floated towards the books. They turned into diamonds before settling onto the spines. The stars which made up Leora faded, and she became a real owl. I've been watching over you two for a while. I'm so very pleased you're here. Your books of magic are now ready. As part of your first day privileges, I can tell you a story about the enchanted owls of Leeds, how they came to be here, and how they look after the city. Would you like that? The twins could only nod, having seemingly lost their ability to speak. The aura opened her wings and tucked Lily and Jake cosily inside her warm feathers. They sat down and gazed at the night sky for a little while. Then the wise owl proceeded to tell the story about the enchanted owls of Leeds. She explained how they first arrived in Leeds and the many ways they look after the city and its inhabitants. Not only that, the owls continue to keep a careful eye on the magical school which lies deep beneath the bustling city. Leora pulled the twins a little closer and said, This academy is full of magic and enchantment. There are many adventures waiting for you. But for now, close your eyes and rest a while. The adventure can wait until tomorrow.